go back to uh, the community edition and I'm going to show you how you can download all the content for this today. Okay, that's our sort of plan, plan one. So, um, so what you want to do is you want to go here and you want to create a folder, folder, and you want to call this folder scalable minus data minus science, like this exactly, because we will be uh, assuming this path, okay? Scalable minus data minus science, all lowercase. So hit the create folder button. I won't do it because I already have that folder for me. It's workspace. Yeah, yeah. so shall I make this bigger? Yeah, so let's really make sure everyone's here, right? This is the main launch point. Okay, so it should be under your workspace, the folder. Okay. And then um, you can go inside, you know, you click this little triangle uh, at the scalable data science folder. <coughs> Has everyone created this folder? No. No, okay, so let's make sure everyone. Uh, so please raise your hand if you haven't, and maybe the neighbors can help a little bit. Yeah, yeah sure. Okay, so we basically go to workspace, which is here, and then we say create and folder. Next step is we need to, we're going to import something, okay? But what are we going to import? So I'm going to show you that. So um, remember our main landing pad for the course is this one, right? Uh, whatever, this is the 2018 version. Everyone should have this bookmarked. So, um, and what I, um, what I would, uh, so if you hit this star button, it'll just take you to the GitHub content that's being sort of GitHub IO generated as a web page, right? So this is the actual content and it's actually Apache 2 licensed or unlicensed from my <laughs> end. So you can fork and uh, if you understand it, it's yours, just like a map theorem, right? So what we wanna do is go into um, something here called uh, BBC archives, right? Because you see an hour ago, I pushed something. So, um, <coughs> so oh, which button did I push or uh, press? Yeah, just the GitHub uh, fork link will take you to this. So then um, just go into this folder, okay? And then go into 2018. Uh, DBC archives, lowercase DBC ar archives. Okay. Now what you want to solve, let's do this again. Uh, so I can, for example, delete this. No worries, confirm and delete. Um, and then I'm gonna import again and paste the right URL. Okay, zero one. Yeah. Okay, so this is maybe the most important step. So now we have all the content for today, okay? So we're just like 19 minutes behind schedule, but it's not too bad. <coughs> okay. So is everyone good? How are your brains? <laughs> good. All right. So, all right. Let's go. So, so what is Apache Spark, right? Um, so Apache Spark is a unified engine for big data processing, right? And this is a really great paper. Um, you can read in ACM Communications recently. But uh, the story kind of started a few years ago. Um, and the main guy behind Apache Spark is Matej Zaharia. So he was a PhD student uh, of, uh, I'd say, one of the most interesting places in the world where um, electrical engineers 
computer scientists are in the same department and um, mathematical statisticians talk very closely with uh, electrical engineers and security systems researchers and network researchers. Uh, that's the magical place called Berkeley, right? So, so there is a reason why Apache Spark naturally comes out of Berkeley. Um, and um, um, so we'll kind of get into a lot of the videos that are embedded, but I might just have to uh, blabber if we can't get all the AV to work. Um, but Databricks is basically a company founded by these PhD students, uh, Mate and a bunch of guys. And uh, that's the community edition we're using. And, um, and the main idea is that, um, uh, as you will see, they are sort of overloading on top of what was called the Hadoop ecosystem, which uh, starts with uh, Google's file system and Google's MapReduce and Yahoo's open sourcing of it. While uh, NSA joined the, joined the the fun and they actually dump what's called Accumulo, which is on top of the Hadoop file system. You'll kind of get a better flavor for these things as we. Yeah. Oh well. So, um, so here is the paper on uh, ACM communications. Uh, Apache Spark is a unified engine for big data processing, as I said. Um, and what is um, what is really the key insights here? It's a simple programming model that can capture streaming, which means data is coming at you in a continuous infinite stream, okay? Uh, or in batch, which means you may have terabytes of data that you've stored from past historical records. That's called batch processing. Uh, and interactive workloads where you actually want to interact with batch and maybe build a model and then mix that with the streaming data that's coming in to update the model. And you want these insights to be interactively explored visually via notebooks. So this is basically what data scientists do, right? So it's really mindful uh, and aware of all these uh, needs uh, of uh, a, a, more, a, a contemporary data scientist. So Apache Spark applications range from finance to scientific data processing and combine libraries for uh, structured query language, SQL, machine learning, and uh, distributed vertex programs or graphs which again, they implement uh, uh, one of Google's models that predates MapReduce, which is called uh, Bulk Synchronous Parallel Processing uh, or Pregel API. And we may get into that actually later on uh, in the course. Okay, so in six years, Apache Spark has grown to 1,000 contributors and thousands of deployments. And the Spark summits are really fun. Um, okay. So this is a bit of history. So it comes from this big grant uh, uh, called Badass, BDAS, which is Berkeley Data Analytics Stack. And you can kind of watch these, uh, these uh, videos and, and papers later. Uh, so here is the State of the Union talk by Ion Stoika, which is uh, Zahari's ad uh, advisor. Um, and um, they ran a bunch of things called AMP Camp. AMP stands for uh, Algorithms, Machines, and People. So now AMP Camp is done at Berkeley. They have something else focused on security and other things now. Okay, so, uh, and Databricks was basically uh, one of the commercial outputs of this whole. So here is the BDAS stack in, a, in one picture, right? So you have uh, um, HDFS, which is the Hadoop distributed file system, which was Yahoo's open sourcing of the Google file system. Uh, all right, <laughs> the cookie. <laughs> So it's distributed processing. Okay. All right, let's continue, right? Um, um, so, so here is the basic stack, right? So, um, so HDFS is this um, Hadoop distributed file store, and um, that's the really open source. So, for example, at Combiant, we have a data engineer here, Alexei. Um, so Alexei, for example, builds these uh, Intel next unit of computing clusters that you can stack on the desk and process, you know, maybe 30 to 100 terabytes of data, maybe 50 terabytes with the forward cooling problems. So there he would use the Hadoop distributed file system because it's completely open source. And you need that kind of clusters for lots of <laughs> operations. You know, if you're doing fraud detection and financial crime or, you know, if you're doing an intelligence operation, okay. Uh, well, okay, NSA has something else inside the mountain, right? We're not going that deep. 
So, uh, so you will need on-premise clusters, and um, and usually HDFS is what people use for it. S3 is something we will we might tap into uh, on Databricks. S3 is uh, I think simple storage service or something. It's Amazon Web Services or AWS uh, is um, sort of a distributed file store. Okay, and uh, in fact this community edition of Databricks currently we all are using is running on a cluster in Amazon Web Services in AWS, a tiny cluster. And uh, we can connect to S3 buckets uh, in those clusters and start processing very large data sets. Of course, you know, Databricks wants you to, you know, they'll only give you a tiny cluster to play and learn. So if you like it and get hooked, you have to buy, um, you know, what they call Databricks units or DDUs, right? So, but for me, Databricks is a very convenient place because a lot of students don't have uh, laptops with at least 16 gigs of RAM, which is sort of my requirement to show you how to do all this in-house on your own laptop. But I can't make that assumption, so we use Databricks. And uh, also, there is no need to worry about getting locked into Databricks. I mean, you have to watch your habits, clicking habits. <laughs> Because uh, there is actually a nice uh, algebraic data structures in this library called Pino uh, that Tilo Wicklund, who's one of the math PhD students, and Don uh, Lilia have been working on. That uh, library um, uh, allows you to babble between notebook formats. So you can go from Databricks to Zeppelin, and they're working on Databricks to Jupyter uh, babbles, babblers. So you, you can become notebook agnostic, so you shouldn't worry too much about it as long as you don't get into habits, right? But I do think Databricks is uh, worthwhile because it's, it's, you know, there's a lot of engineering you need to go, um, okay? So we will start a cluster and things like that soon once I sort of finish the introduction. So um, Hadoop Yarn is uh, what's called a resource manager. So there's uh, some process that sort of runs, that manages the cluster itself, right? And, uh, you know, there are sort of, uh, lower, there is another um, uh, cluster manager called Mesos, and uh, in fact, Zaharia actually wrote Spark itself as an application of <laughs> for Mesos, right? So he's uh, okay. <laughs> um, okay, so um, I mean, um, so we will be mainly uh, learning about Spark Core today. Some app, something called resilient distributed data sets. That's our main thing we will learn about. Uh, and then um, there are other very important libraries. So my plan in the afternoon is to get you guys into Spark SQL, which is uh, essentially uh, a family of no SQL languages, which will allow you to interactively explore data using the structured theory language of SQL uh, uh, at scale. Okay? And that's sort of first step, because we need to be able to understand the data. Um, Okay, so uh, of course there is uh, uh, GraphX, which uh, we may get to uh, uh, later on uh, when we start maybe uh, hopefully uh, sucking in the entire open street map of Scandinavia, right? This is the open source map of, uh, say, at least Stockholm. <laughs> and then we can actually uh, uh, do certain operations and then convert this open street map into uh, what's called a lumped Markov chain. So we can take street segments and map them to states and intersections and states. And then if you know about Markov chains, we can actually represent uh, a, a Markov chain uh, using these operations. And that Markov chain state space itself can be represented using GraphX, which is a, a, you know, a distributed uh, representation of a very large graph that won't fit in the memory of one machine. So it can be split up in a nice way and thrown into multiple machines and uh, so on. So we, may, we will get into that, I believe. We may get a little bit into MLlib, but I, I, I don't want to, you know, there's all the recipes like, thank you very much. You can adjust the problem. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Okay, so, um, yeah. Um, yeah, let's 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 give Mate one more shot, right? I I, <laughs> I met him in Dublin. He's a nice guy. Yeah. Right. So let's see.
There's Yay. cooking for one, and then there's cooking for a thousand. It's more than just a difference of scale. Big crowds demand completely different facilities and procedures. The same is true for today's big data, which is intractable without such techniques as parallel processing, in-memory computation, and on-the-fly optimization. Join us as Matei Zaharia describes how his creation helps the world gain insight from information in Apache Spark, a unified engine for big data processing. Okay. You should read that paper. You're San serious. Francisco's Soma District is home to some of the world's most data-intensive companies. It's also where Databricks Chief Technical Officer Matei Zaharia learned firsthand how tools of the time, such as MapReduce, just weren't enough. I worked with people at Facebook and at Yahoo, and I saw that they all wanted to do more and more types of workloads on these large-scale clusters. So basically, the goal was to design a more general computing engine to do different types of computation you know, with the same data on the same kind of hardware as MapReduce. He specifically wanted to address three problems he saw in MapReduce. One thing was iterative algorithms that make many passes to the same data. Uh, second thing was real-time streaming. So instead of running this batch job every night to compute a report, can you just compute it incrementally as new data arrives throughout the day? And the third thing was interactive queries. To meet these goals, Dr. Zaharia and his colleagues chose to keep Apache Spark's core small with libraries that pass data efficiently to each other. That's actually really important for big data in particular, because moving data is expensive. Instead, Apache Spark's core pipelines functions, for example, when using a data stream to train an intelligent agent. As you parse each record from the JSON, it immediately feeds that into the machine learning function. There's no need to save it anywhere else. And as a result, you get something faster end to end with fewer data copies and fewer, you know, less I.O. The pipelining process takes advantage of graph theory to make everything run even faster. Spark looks at the graph and says, OK, what, what order do I need to run things in to get the final result you want out of it? And uh, before we begin doing that, we also optimize the graph a little bit. So we look, we say, if you're chaining together some operations that we can compact down into one thing, we're going to optimize that. The results have enabled new applications. They have these transparent fish called zebrafish, and they could actually take images of all the neurons in, in that fish's brain and see when they were active. And like they saw them light up as like little specks of light on, on a photo. Um, and so, so they, they had this new imaging technology and they connected this to Apache Spark to actually analyze the data in real time. Dr. Zaharia believes that Apache Spark could eventually put such power on every desktop. Already we see a lot of research where people just take all of Wikipedia and do you know, uh, all kinds of stuff with it, like find spammers, try to figure out bias and so on. But I think over time, it'll be possible to do that for like pretty much all human generated text. Get all the details in the November 2016 issue of Communications of the ACM in the contributed article, Apache Spark, a unified engine for big data processing. Okay. Great. Thanks for your patience. With uh, the video was worthwhile, right? It's a lot better than me blabbering because I, I, I English just like I don't know. It's not my native language. Okay. Um, yeah. So I, I highly recommend reading this. So if you want to read one paper, like over a bathtub, whatever, uh, this is the best one. There is a, a more technical paper, uh, which was done a bit earlier. It's a, a very nice paper. Um, um, so, okay, so basically that's what uh, he was talking about. There are various libraries. Um, we will get into Spark streaming and, um, and um, there's a bunch of other things about uh, memory optimization and things like this, which we will abstract a little bit because I have to do a whole workshop on Spark internals for uh, uh, data engineering scientists, you know, which, um, which we won't do here. Okay. 
So here are the key points. It started in 2011, uh, sort of DARPA, the guys that bought, brought us the internet, um, Lawrence Berkeley Labs, NSF, AWS, Google, SAP. So it's an industry uh, uh, government sort of collaboration <coughs> and um, from the ant lab. So let's now um, ask, what is uh, the big data problem? Um, you know, what's the uh, issue about hardware? What does distributing workloads mean? And uh, how to handle failed and slow machines? So this is um, uh, uh, a, a sort of slice through uh, key lecture videos in Anthony Joseph, who is the Chancellor's Professor at uh, UC Berkeley in Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. His uh, edX Big Data Series course called Berkeley XCS 100.1X. Why am I doing this? Because I, I took this course. That's how I learned about this stuff. So uh, it's a, so I've just sort of handpicked a few videos. And by the way, this entire course <coughs> and another course, which we will overload on, by Amit Talbakar, who's also part of the AMP Lab, uh, and he's at UCLA still, I think, uh, called Scalable Machine Learning. So these two courses are already here. So if you go to training and tutorials, uh, I'm sort of going to quickly go there. And then you have all those educational materials. So if you go to, uh, um, uh, here you go. So I'm actually just, uh, Introduction to Big Data from 2015. Uh, most of the stuff is still fine, uh, conceptually. Um, uh, this is AJ's course. So I'm basically showing you little videos from here and there in the course. Uh, and then I will also later on show uh, videos and concepts and uh, a bit more math from uh, the other one, uh, Scalable Machine Learning course. Okay. And you, these are good places to dive to, to figure out what's really going on, because how can you do linear and logistic regression over terabytes of data? Well, you need to understand not just linear algebra, but you need to understand what's called distributed linear algebra, where you have to do arithmetic operations on separate machines and minimize the communication overhead between machines. So you will have now classical numerical analysis is you know time and space complexity in two dimensions. Distributed uh, numerical analysis for big data has time, space, and communication complexity. So it's a three-dimensional asymptotic uh, problem, okay, of algorithms, algorithm analysis. Um, so, you know, there are, and, you know, there are much more deeper places you could dive. So basically, one of this one is Reza Zadeh's course. Um, so these are a bunch of math students here. So... Um, um, so he's in the computational engineering mathematics, or whatever they call that in Stanford. Computational engineering mathematics. I think. So yeah, his course is quite good. Um, so um, I think it's this one. Uh, distributed algorithms and optimization. So, you know, this is what I would knock myself out if you're into sort of, you know, algorithms, random structures, and so on. Um, okay, but uh, here we will sort of just be a bit more applied, quite a bit more applied. Okay, um, so let's watch this briefly. It's only um, 1.48 minutes. Additional analysis tools include Unix shell commands, pandas, and off. One of the things that all of these tools have in common is they all run on a single machine. The big data problem means that data is growing faster than computations do. We have many different sources of data, and those sources of data are growing. Web, mobile, scientific. Storage is getting cheaper. This means people are saving more data. And the size of storage is doubling every 18 months. We can save even more data. But CPUs are not increasing in speed. And we have many storage bottlenecks getting data in and out of this massive storage. Some examples of big data include Facebook's daily logs. They're 60 terabytes in size. Every day, they collect 60 terabytes worth of data. The Thousand Genomes Project has 200 terabytes of human genome data. Google's web index is estimated to be larger than 10 petabytes of data. Now, driving all of this is the fact that storage has really dropped in cost. A one terabyte disk is only $35, but it can take three hours to read the data from the disk or write it to the disk. 
The big data problem means that a single machine can no longer process or even hold all the data that we want to analyze. The only solution we have is to distribute the data over large clusters. Here's an example of a large cluster, one of Google's data centers. It contains tens of thousands of machines. How do we program this thing? Okay, so I think these are, uh, I would say, sort of minimal. Hardware we have for big data includes lots of hard drives and CPUs. The question is, how do we organize these CPUs and hard drives? <coughs> one approach is to put them all in one big box. This is a solution that people used in the 1990s. But it was very expensive because these machines were only produced in very low volume, and they were considered premium hardware. And for today's big data, these machines are not big enough. The alternative that we use for big data today is consumer-grade hardware. It's not the gold-plated servers that we put traditionally into data centers, but rather it's more desktop-like kinds of machines. These machines are very easy to add in terms of capacity. They're much cheaper for, for an individual CPU and disk than traditional servers. But they're not as reliable, and they're much harder to manage. The trade-off is we'll deal with this complexity in software instead. So some of the problems that we have with cheap hardware include failures. So Google's numbers are that you lose between one to 5% of hard drives every year and 0.2% of memory chips per year. Also, network speeds are much slower than the shared memory speeds that we found in those big box 1990s solutions. It's much slower to read something over the network and the network can be much slower than reading something from a storage drive. Also, these machines have very uneven performance. Some may be very fast, others may be very slow, sometimes because they're failing. Okay, so. Okay, so. So, what's hard about cluster computing? Well, one challenge is how do we split work across machines? Let's look at an example. How do we count the number of occurrences of each word in a document? So here we have the document, I am Sam, I am Sam, Sam I am, do you like green eggs and ham? We'd like to count the words. So for example, there are three occurrences of I, three occurrences of am, three occurrences of Sam, and one of do, and one of you, and one of like, and so on. So one approach we could do is to use a hash table. So here, we start with an empty hash table. We look at each word. We start with I. I doesn't appear in the hash table, so we add it with a single occurrence. We then examine the word am. Am does not occur in the hash table, so we add it with one occurrence. We look at Sam. Sam occurs not at all in our hash table, so we add Sam to our hash table with one occurrence. Now we see I. That appears in our hash table already, and so we update the value to two. And we can keep doing this for each of the words in our document. Okay, so we will do word count, which is the hollow world of big data, um, once you guys know enough Scala, which, um, let's see, which might happen before or after Fika, so let's see how long it was supposed to happen before Fika. <laughs> How do we deal with failures? So in this case, the first machine has failed. The simplest solution is to just launch another task, either on that machine if it's recovered, or on another machine. How do we deal with slow tasks? So in this case, all of the other tasks finish quickly, but the task that was running on machine one hasn't finished yet. All we do is just simply launch another task and then kill that original task. We can launch that task on a different machine because maybe that first machine was about to fail and so it's running very slowly. So, um, sorry, did I? So, here's the 
the basic map reduce. Okay. Um, so let's see this. But you should have execution of map reduce. Each stage that you perform <coughs> passes through the hard drive. So the initial step of the map reads data from the hard drive, processes it, and then writes it out to disk before we perform the shuffle operation to send data to the reducers. At the reducers, they read the data in from disk, process it, and write the results out to disk. As a result, if we have an iterative job, so here a job that has three stages, and we're just repeating that, so we do stage one, stage two, stage three, then repeat stage one again, then there will be a lot of disk I.O. operations for each repetition. You can see this in the figure above the stage one, stage two, stage three diagram. Each of those mappers is reading in data from this. So does everyone, um, I think I might have skipped a video. Um, does everyone know what map reduce is? No. This is the most important concept. So let's just, um, okay, so I have, um, I don't know. Um, um, so there was Sam. I am, um, I don't know. I'm going to just make something up. Green Sam, I am. Okay. So this is a sentence. I'm breaking it into uh, words, right? So I want to count the number of uh, words here. Um, and what I'm trying to do is. Um, um, so, you know, hash table is the standard way of doing it in a single machine, right? It's, it's called the dictionary in Python. But if you have like a whole lot of these kinds of words, and like terabytes, and you still want to do word count, what are you going to do? That's what he's um, trying to say. So the, the idea of MapReduce, which is uh, this Google's paper, um, was this very simple. They said, okay, this thing is actually, say, it's a very, very long text. I'm going to break it into small pieces and put this in one particular machine. So this is the disk of a machine. That's those are the cylinders. Actually, the hard drive of the machine. Okay, and I'm going to put maybe this piece in another machine's hard drive. Right. So that's what these uh, that's what these cylinders are. Okay. And then what I'm going to do I'm going to do is called a map operation. So a map operation. This is a map Bourbaki notation for a map. It basically takes some x and maps it to some function of x. Right? So the function of x, so here x is a word like span, and the function of x is going to be uh, the integer one, you know, uh, or turning this into a, into a tuple, span and one. That's what I'm gonna do. So, because I can do it atomically for every word, right? So it's a map. So this I can do in parallel, you see, because these words are here, all I'm adding is the integer one to it. Right? I can do it in parallel. Now, of course, I want to count, right? So I need to know how many sands there are and stuff. So this is the reduce operation. Right? So to reduce, um, you know, I have to define uh, some kind of uh, 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 typically a binary operation that satisfies some conditions. So here I'm saying, give me some word x. Um, and um, you know, and another word occurrence of the same word x. So there are the two sams, right? And I want to be able to reduce this. So I'm going to define some kind of a plus operation. So if the keys are the same, this is called reduce by key. If the keys are the same, these two things are going to get reduced to x comma two. Right? Okay. But now, uh, and, and, and if this arithmetic operation is such that the order in which you do doesn't matter, right? So whether this SAM in that hard drive or whatever, you know, the order doesn't matter because addition one plus one is one plus one, right? Uh, so that's commutative. But um, so, if, if, so if, if the order doesn't matter, then uh, you can get away with doing it in parallel. Okay, that's, Sort of the high-level idea. So now all these uh, SAMs will come together, um, and uh, and these um, things uh, that have been mapped onto will get added, and uh, it'll it'll return. So it's a so it's a full left or a full right operation. Okay, that's kind of what he's trying to say. But then the point is because SAMs may be in different hard drives, then uh, when you have to reduce and the SAMs have to meet. They have to go through the sort of Ethernet cable, right? 
and that's slower. It's orders of magnitude slower than uh, the, the speed at which you can access uh, memory or, uh, or, or disk, especially SSD. So then um, you, know, you, you have what's called a shuffling problem so you have to sort of shuffle across the network. So that's kind of what he's talking about here. Yeah. Writing data to disk, only to be read back again from disk by the reducers, written to disk by that reducer, then read again by the next stages of uh, mapper, and so on. The problem here is that disk error is very slow. So if we're running iterative jobs, they're primarily going to run at the speed of the disks instead of the speed of our CPUs. This is a motivation for Apache Spark because it's not just iterative jobs that we want to perform when we're doing data science, but also complex jobs like interactive mining or stream processing or interactive queries. In each one of these cases, we start with some source data and we repeatedly read that data and perform calculations and write data back out to data. That high amount of disk I.O. means things are going to run very slowly because, again, disk I.O. is very slow. So disk I.O. is what was happening um, with Hadoop file system and the Google file system, right? They were just writing to disk across lots of machines and, and doing some map reduce operations and writing it back to disk, right? Reading and writing it. So what Apache Spark did is, well, let's just use RAM, right? The random access memory, the classical von Neumann architecture, which is all we have to today's computers. You just use it and then uh, accessing uh, memory is much faster and the price of memory is dropping. So that's the, that's the main idea, right? So that's what this one is basically saying. Uh -huh. I am going to uh, run out of power. Technology trends show that the cost of memory is dropping. Here's a graph that shows the cost of memory with, on the x-axis, year, and on the y-axis, price. And this is a log linear plot. And so you can see that memory is dropping exponentially over time. In 2010, it only cost one cent per megabyte. Now, what does this mean? Cheaper memory means we can put a lot more memory at each server. So now the hardware that we have for big data is lots of hard drives, lots of CPUs, and lots of memory. So this gives us an opportunity. We can keep more data in memory instead of writing it out to slow disk and then having to read it right back in on those slow disks. So this opportunity led to the creation of a new distributed execution engine, Apache Spark. So we'd like to use memory instead of disk. Remember that what happens when we have an iterative task is we read in data from disk, process it, write it out to disk, read it in for the next iteration, process it, write it back to disk, and so on. Similarly, when we're performing a query, we read information from disk, perform that query job to give a result, and then for the next query that comes in, we read the data back in all over again and present a result. And if we're operating interactively, this is going to be very, very slow. So instead, what we'd like to do is use memory and use memory for in-data sharing. So here, when we read in from disk for iteration one, when we're finished, we write it to memory. And that way, iteration two can read from very fast memory and write to very fast memory. The same thing with our query. We do a one-time processing step to read our data into distributed memory. And from there, all the queries run from memory. This can be anywhere from 10 to 100 times faster than using the network or the disk. The abstraction that Apache Spark provides is that of the Resilient Distributed Data Sets, or RDBs. We write our programs in terms of operations on distributed data sets. And these are partition collections of objects that are spread across a cluster stored either in memory or on disk. We can manipulate and build RDBs using a diverse set of parallel transformations, including map, filter, and join, and actions, including count, collect, and save. We'll do all of this, so don't worry. I'm sort of playing the video because, uh, you know, this guy is the expert, right? So we'll do every one of these actions and more with a lot of cartoons. And, but um, 
Spark automatically keeps track of how we created the RDB and will automatically rebuild them if a machine fails or a job is running slow. So, okay, so that's the other um, core concept. Um, so, yeah, so I think I, in the interest of time, I'm going to let you guys uh, watch this later. So this is just showing how much difference there is uh, when you use uh, machine learning algorithms for large data sets uh, via Spark versus Hadoop's MapReduce, the classical method. And you know, this is just orders of magnitude faster with Spark, just because of memory access. And why this becomes extremely important for uh, things like k-means clustering. So how many of you don't know k-means clustering? Okay, good. So k-means clustering is basically like, you can think of it as a, as a, so you have a bunch of points, let's say in 3D, and it's some kind of a heuristic algorithm that tries to find clusters. So, you think, so maybe there are little blobs points in 3D. It's a heuristic way of finding what the blobs are, what the clusters are, right? Um, and, uh, you know, that's enough to, you know. So it's, it's a very important algorithm that you would throw at uh, some data to get an idea of what's going on, right? Um, and in k-means clustering, and in the same in logistic regression, which is another, something called a binary classifier. And we may visit that for the natural language processing modules. Uh, you know, it's like a spam filter is a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a binary classifier. So it says if the email comes, is it spam or not spam, for example, right? So these are classical, basic machine learning data mining algorithms. And the most important thing about these algorithms, they're iterative, because what's really under the hood is uh, something called an optimization algorithm, which is essentially, uh, you know, something hopping like a ball on some valley, and the valley is some kind of a cost function you're trying to minimize, and sort of the 2D version, so there's parameter space on the plane, like say two different parameters you're trying to tune, then you're trying to find the sort of low energy point, right, or a low cost point. So usually you'll start somewhere and do an iteration, right? This is basically optimization. Uh, it's a huge field, of course. And um, so the point here is that these algorithms are iterative by nature because you need to do a step and then try to go somewhere, do another step and so on. So if they're iterative, then you need to basically keep the state, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, somehow, right? And that's where Spark kicks butt because it's basically can keep things in, in memory, uh, uh, in distributed memory, and uh, instead of writing to disk and reading back from disk, it really shines. Yeah. Uh, and of course, data science, uh, mostly you do machine learning in the end, right? So here's a summary um, of, um, um, uh, you know, um, Apache Spark. So we use memory instead of disk alone, and thus it's a lot faster than Hadoop MapReduce. Of course, memory is going to be limited, right? So you may only have, say, 32 gigs or even, you know, just maybe, uh, whatever, 6 gigs. Uh, then you can always spill into disk. If there's not enough memory, it does this classical Hadoop route, and you can always spill into disk. Um, and then the abstraction is called, uh, uh, you know, RDD, and this is a resilience abstraction. So resilience against machine failures. Remember, about 5% of Google's data centers hard drives fail, and 0.2% of memory cards fail per year which means there is a good probability that your job, while you're running it, will, will have hardware failure, right? And so we are accounting for it through the software abstraction called RDD. Um, and at a high level, RDD is simply a lineage graph, so it keeps track of a recipe of what needs to be done from the raw data that will be in a, a distributed file store, okay, like uh, Hadoop which itself is fault tolerant, right? So there's ways of keeping data in a distributed file store so that if one hard drive fails, uh, we can still recover the data, right? That's essentially HDFS. So because the raw data itself is in a fault tolerant file store and your machine learning algorithm, whatever you're doing on top of it, essentially is a directed acyclic graph or lineage graph, what transformation you do to data when and where uh, and what has happened so far, so as long as um, RDD's lineage graphs are kept track of, 
you know uh, how to recover the part of the lineage that uh, was you know, failed due to hardware reasons. And that's essentially the high level idea. So you, I strongly recommend you read the paper because it's actually an easy read. Okay. And uh, Spark, I think, still is the fastest uh, uh, one petabyte sort. So sort is the most basic operation that um, you, you want to do with uh, stuff, right? Uh, a lot of things basically boil down to sorts and joints. So um, it, it beat this uh, one petabyte sort record. Um, so I guess it um, takes 234 minutes running on 190 Amazon Elastic Cloud EC2 instances. These are sort of machines in AWS. Um, and they sorted 1,000 terabytes. It's still the record, I believe. And of course, the Spark expertise corresponds to the highest median salary in the US last year. It's like 150K. So this course originally was developed in New Zealand by uh, CTOs of, uh, you know, input from C chief technical officers from three different cities in New Zealand, right? So this is uh, Christchurch, Wellington, and Auckland. And it is catered to help you take the first steps to prepare for the Spark certification exam, uh, which is uh, actually a, an exam in four languages, right? It's, it's uh, you can skip one language, it's actually five languages. So it's Java, Scala, R, Python and SQL, and that's essentially the, the, the basic tool chain of a data scientist, and uh, at least in the Silicon Valley, but everywhere pretty much. Um, and of course, we will be using Scala in this course, uh, mainly because Spark itself is written in Scala, and we will get a crash course into Scala soon. Um, and uh, again, Scala was chosen as the language because if you're going to be working in a competitive uh, industry, uh, and you are not, you, you know, you're limiting yourself to your syntactic comforts of R or Python for other reasons, you know, then the problem is R and Python will always be behind in Apache Spark because somebody else is basically writing the Scala babblers for you from your Python and Spark. So you will not be in the bleeding edge. You will not be able to tap into the latest stuff that's coming straight out of Scala, which you will definitely need a competitive edge if you're going to do recommender systems or fraud detection or anything like that. So. That's the main reason, and it's a lot easier to, to teach uh, data scientists Scala than to hire a whole bunch of, you know, Scala experts who take the insights of data scientists written in Python and babble it back, and there are technical issues with uh, using Spark Core and, and Python. We don't avoid them. I'll show you how to, how to like, uh, babble between languages. It's very important to do that as well, because there's no point in reinventing the wheel. But uh, it's very important to think uh, think in Scala or, or try to write code directly in Scala. Okay, so here are some key papers. Um, well, you know we cannot forget that uh, you know Lisp uh, Lisp processing uh, you know started in the 1956 to 70 79. <coughs> basic languages for parallel programming, and this is Google's uh, MapReduce paper. I should definitely read this. I highly recommend. Uh, this is Yahoo's Apache Hadoop. Uh, paper, uh, yeah, uh, originally from Yahoo's Notch project, and then uh, Google, um, um, so the cloud computing with AWS, Elastic MapReduce. Um, th this is uh, the sort of Amazon's Hadoop <laughs> S3, um, and then yeah, so this is the HDFS um, paper. This one uh, is maybe the first main technical paper in Usenix Hot Cloud. Uh, you can just read that. The ACM communications is too decorative. Uh, you know, it's more um, high level. This one's good. Uh, this one's really good as well. Um, so if you want to want to read one paper, just do this. Um, yeah, this is the ACM one. Okay, this this line of course continues, uh, but um, basically this is from uh, one of the videos of AJ's. Okay. So, um, so the history kind of begins in 2002 for big data, well, a little bit earlier. It's already um, page rank using uh, Pregel uh, stuff. Okay, now like what's happening in 2018 and sort of circles I try to keep an eye on, there's Stanford's Dawn Lab um, and uh, Berkeley's Rice Lab. It's these guys doing other things, so you can check it out if you like. And then uh, I think this is maybe something you highly recommended strongly recommended listening for train rides. 
So you will kind of see what's really happening at least up to last year on this ecosystem. Because Spark was just one part of a very, very large ecosystem, right? Because you have, as I already said, NSA has a lot of stuff open sourced. Um, and the GCHQ, the British intelligence, has a lot of really interesting things that they, that's built on top of. You know. So anyway, uh, it's a big thing, uh, but we'll focus on Spark because it's, uh, it's well integratable into the, uh, into the rest of the ecosystem, big data. Okay, so if you want to stay connected, uh, maybe you should, uh, you know, subscribe to these YouTube channels. Um, you know, of course, yeah, I just try and get information once a month because it's uh, too much going on. Okay, sorry about all the technical issues, guys. Um, I, I hope you have like some kind of a high level idea of what Apache Spark is about. And uh, there are pointers to dive as deep as you like. So let's... Um, in the next 15 minutes, let's um, let's take our next main step. Um, so we've already logged into Databricks and done this stuff, so we can skip it. Um, okay, so let's um, let's see. Yeah, so I have to probably there is a lot of Databricks lingo, right? So let me let me try and tell you what the essentials of Databricks Cloud or DBC is in a, in a big hurry, right? It's quite a lot of words thrown around. So what are the, uh, DBC essentials? So what is a Databricks Cloud exactly? So there's something called a Databricks Workspace, which is essentially where you have all your notebooks and things like this. And uh, you know it's sort of your nice convenient front end on top of Apache Spark, right? Uh, and uh, what's underneath is uh, the Databricks platform, which does a lot of uh, uh, engineering optimizations for specific uh, public cloud providers like AWS. They also have Microsoft Azure uh, um, uh, backends for hardware. So this is kind of their business model, right? So they want to sort of have let data scientists have fun and not worry about engineers, right? But, it's, it's, it's okay to some extent. And, and the nice thing is you can, uh, if in the professional version, you can actually have hooks into GitHub. And so all the code you're writing, the pure Scala version can be committed to GitHub. So you can, you can, you can take that in to do proper you know, on-prem jobs as well. So it's not a, yeah. So here are the main uh, concepts. So uh, there's something called a shard. So what we are currently is on a community.cloud.databricks.com. This is basically my shard. Um, it's an instance of Databricks workspace, okay? So I can come back to it, log back into it. The notebooks I made will still be there, and, okay? Um, so a cluster is just a Spark cluster. So there can be many clusters per shard. So while we are um, at it, uh, well, let's be nice to Databricks, okay? So we'll, we'll have Fika soon, so I was, I was gonna show you guys how to start a cluster, but, um, but let's do that maybe after Fika. Um, so basically to start a cl cluster, you just go here and you say create cluster, right? And uh, you will need to create a cluster before we start the Scala worksheet. Yeah, so, so you can, yeah, let's do it. So you just create a cluster, my free cluster, whatever you wanna call it, right? It's small, okay? Um, so don't uh, really change any of the settings, just leave it as default for now. Um, and uh, yeah. Um, yeah, so um, so actually, uh, so let's see. Uh, just to be really sure. <coughs> yeah. Anyway, I'm gonna go with this 3.5 LTS. Uh, so this is what the course is designed to uh, work on. Okay, so this is the safe pet, but of course I kind of want to play it dangerously, so it's supposed to be backward compatible, so I'm going with 2.3, okay. Anyway, so we'll see what happens. So now if you see, um, you know, it's only, uh, it's an instance, uh, so Python version 2 uh, is recommended. So there is a free 6 GB memory, that's what we have. Uh, it's a um, community edition user. Your clusters will automatically terminate after an ideal period of two hours. So we can actually start it, have Fika and continue. It'll be fine, we'll go for lunch. And then uh, for more configuration options, you can see here. Um, yeah. 
So it's not a lot you can do with the free one. So and then it's running in US West 2C. So yeah, let's make sure it is because uh, some of the stuff um, I'll be later on giving you will be in Amazon buckets in US West 2C, which is one of the AWS regional, uh, what do they call them, zones in Oregon, West Coast of the US. And uh, currently it has the lowest spot prices. So, and yeah, right now, yeah, it should be fine. So it's usually US West to ABC. And um, because, you know, if you have data in S3 buckets in AWS in, 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 you know, in, in, in Germany, then you have to pay intercontinental bit transfer costs to suck the data in Oregon on the free cluster. So, so if I'm providing you with that kind of a service because I want a, a meaty data set for you to play with, then you, you guys will just run my, my AWS, it's my personal credit card, so it will kill me. So, but I'm just telling you, I've done this before with my students in New Zealand, so. so but right now everything is safe, so, yeah. Yo, you can call it whatever you want, you know. I'm going to call this Britney Spears rules, you know. I don't know. I mean, it doesn't matter. It has to be a non-empty string, right? Um, right? Well, anyway. Yeah, so I thought, I don't know what, I don't know. I've been just listening to a lot of Eminem lately, and, and, and he has some weird thing for Britney Spears, so I'm going to kind of, okay, so this should work, right? So this should create. So this will start. Um, so, you know, it'll take about a minute and that is sort of what you want to be, uh, do, you know, you want to have a cluster running when you start playing with the notebooks. So let it, let it do its thing. So let's, we can go to recent and then, uh, you know, this is an easy way to navigate, go back to where we were. Okay. So now we started a cluster. And of course, if you have a professional shard, you can have multiple clusters with different sizes, number of machines running on the same shard, which means like the engineering team and the data science team or the more mathy team, they can all see notebooks uh, and they can collaborate. They can see past messages. There's a video, whatever. And there's GitHub integration. So it's, um, it's, a, it's a nice... Um, Okay, so a notebook is simply a list of markdown and executable commands in a, in a mother language, but then you can call other languages by uh, cell specific uh, <coughs> language mark, uh, language uh, identifiers. I'll show you all that later. So here is the sort of things in a picture. So we have a team, so it's a couple guys. We can't have one person team. Um, then you have, um, you know, browsers. So these guys will be using browsers and they log into a shard. So you guys now cannot be in a team, right? Unless you share your password for your community edition, which is not a good idea. Uh, but in a professional version, you can do this, right? So then, um, and then the shard has multiple notebooks because shard has a state and, and uh, that state holds multiple notebooks with uh, you know, different objects in memory according to execution order in each notebook and all that. And then uh, each notebook can be attached to a Spark cluster or detached, okay? So. Uh, and of course, this is the cloud, right? So you can now plug in AWS or Azure, or eventually Google and so on. Um, okay, that's some Databricks lingo. Let's see. Um, yeah. So here's some mechanics of notebooks. So you can, you can um, go somewhere to a folder and you can say, um, whatever, create notebook. So let me just go here and say, create notebook. Okay. So now you have to choose the language, right? Usually it puts Python as the default language because a lot of people use Python, but choose Scala and then say my notebook, whatever you want to call it. Um, so, and then it's automatically choosing Britney Spears rules cluster because that's already running. Okay, so now I've um, created a notebook. And you see now this is green because that cluster is ready, right? So if you go to clusters, you see Britney Spears rules cluster is running. Um, okay, so now let's um, go back to this notebook I created. Okay, 
So you see, you see in the bracket here it says Scala, so that means it's the Scala notebook. So which means if you do one plus one, okay, and uh, you can do Shift Enter or, or Control Enter. Shift Enter creates a new cell below, and Control Enter will uh, just execute the current cell. So it's a result as an integer too, right? So I would like everyone to be able to do this before so it's five minutes. Command submitted to cluster for execution. Yeah, so please wait for like at least 30 to 40 seconds because a whole lot of bells and whistles are getting turned off. The first one plus one operation. I mean, it's not going to be the same, right? It's a lot faster now. Okay, 5 points. It took yeah. 32 seconds. It took, oh, yours took 32 seconds? Well, we're all launching the these uh, EC2 instances, right? So I don't know how the Databricks engineers are doing this sort of, what's that called, load balancing, Alexei? When you, yeah, I don't know. It's a lot going on. So just be slightly patient. Um, you should be able to do one plus one or, or if you... Whatever, right? So, um, yeah, shift enter or control enter basically lets you um, stay in the same cell when you execute it. So, so let's kind of go back here. Okay. So cloning a notebook is actually pretty straightforward as well. So you can just say file clone and it will usually put a parentheses one there. So that's a clone. You can change the name, <coughs> whatever you want. And you can choose to put it in any folder you like, you know, so you can do that if you like. So cloning is useful because uh, well, you can keep a copy and um, what else? Um, yeah, so we already did attaching notebook to a cluster. Um, yeah, cells are the unit that make up the notebook, right? So if I go to, if I'm if I just double click it, I'm seeing something called percent MD because this cell is markdown cell. It's, you know, the language is markdown. Um, and then this star, star, star is just a, a, a vertical line in markdown, like a horizontal line. And uh, this hash, 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 hash is header level four, right? And uh, this bang, right, is like, execute, show me, uh, I'm calling this quick note and I'm putting an image, a PNG image in a specific uh, hypertext transfer protocol uh, URL. So it's just, that's how the image you're seeing, right? And that, so you can kind of figure out, uh, so if you just get out of the markdown cell, it'll render it. Um, right, and then if you want to create and edit um, um, a new markdown cell, you basically go and, and click this plus sign, it will say insert a new cell. And Jupiter has its own way of doing it upstairs, and you know, Zeppelin has its own way. But so yeah, now I can say person MD, and then I can say hello world. Right? This is my sort of markdown. Okay. Um, yeah. So if I if I would just put a one hash, it's a header level one. So this is kind of how I'm writing all the notes, right? So you can sort of take, in, take your own notes you and clone these things and work them, whatever. Okay, so that's um, a little world. Um, let's see if we if we have coffee and uh, food outside, maybe. It's just arriving. So, so let's just do this 
Um, and then let's take a break. So now our first Scala command is println. So this is how you print a line in Scala. And I'm doing system dot current time in milliseconds. This is just a, a command. Let's make sure this runs. Yeah. So this is the current time in, in milliseconds. If you control enter here. Uh, yeah, see, it's changing. And um, right, this is a long integer representation of the current time in milliseconds. So, and of course, it's changing as the coffee is arriving, right? So, uh, who's, who's hungry for sugar? I don't know. I'm definitely. Um, uh, and for lunch, guys, uh, I recommend uh, if you if you want to eat a proper Swedish lunch, then uh, I recommend uh, a cafe called Rulon, which is just you get out of the building and you walk across 